I love this idea, this word avoda, avoda, I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, this idea that, that at the core essence of our call as human beings, we are called to worship, we are called to work, we are called to serve. And it's, it's, it's a profound theological truth that actually we are at our best when we're working, which is good news for us because how many of us know we spend an awful lot of time working, amen, right? That's just true. We spend most of our time, most of our waking hours working in one way or another. And I was thinking about this question as I was uh, contemplating our time together. I was thinking about if you were going to evaluate kind of have a question that would evaluate in one uh, simple one simple kind of evaluating metric, one simple uh, rubric, uh, what the, whether or not you were successfully avodaing, to use Prejo's word, whether or not you were successfully at work be, uh, fulfilling God's call, fulfilling God's purpose in the way that you work, in the way that you worship, in the way that you serve, what would that question be? What would that rubric be? You know, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. And if that life is woven up into our ability to work and to worship and to serve, then what's the question that we would ask that would help us know, is our life, is the direction of our life, our work, our worship, and our service going in the direction that, that leads to abundant life? What would that question be? And I think Jesus would answer the question uh, pretty particularly. I think Jesus would say... That the world will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. Our work is critically important. Our ability to serve is really important. Our ability to worship God is really important. And yet, at the end of the day, the, the key metric, the key rubric to know whether or not we are working and worshiping and serving in a direction that is, that is leading to life abundant or leading somewhere else, the key indicator is going to be how do we treat other people? How are our relationships? How are we doing managing our relationships? And so for a few minutes today, I want to reflect with you on this really fascinating relationship Jesus has with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. In, in John chapter 11, it begins this way, and this is a lot, big text. I'm just going to take the, the, the liberty to read a big chunk of text and then um, just highlight a few things and give us uh, something to think about. Now, a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and Mar of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the feet of the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But Jesus, when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, after hearing that, having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he got, they said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you. Are you sure you want to go there again? Jesus answered, um, are there not 12 hours of the day? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of the world, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. And after seeing this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, and he is referring to, they thought he was referring to merely sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. A um, little bit further down, it says, When Jesus arrived, the he found the tomb that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. And Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went in to meet him while Mary stayed at home. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she'd said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the place, was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out, and they followed her because they thought she was going uh, to the tomb to weep there. Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him. She knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And then Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, deeply disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it, and Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, there's already a stench because he's been dead for four days. But Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of those who are standing here, that they might believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. Passing uh, just a little further down in, in verse 12, six days before the Passover, same location, same place, Jesus came to Bethany, the house of Lazarus, where he had raised, where he, whom he had raised from the dead. They gave a great dinner for, Mar- for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. And Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard and anointed Jesus' feet and, washed them, and wiped them with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and he kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. And Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. So you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. This is God's word to us. I want to look at this incredible passage because it is so, um, it's so incredible for uh, me. As it, so it's so incredible for us to think about this, this incredible family that Jesus loves. This non-traditional household in some ways that you might, you might think of it where there's the uh, it seems like an unmarried brother living with his two sisters and yet uh, living this, this communal life together. And Jesus loves them. He loves them individually. He loves them as a community. And Jesus' relationship and love for each one of them, you can see it, can't you? The way that he is able to love them in the ways that are unique to them and to their own uh, situation, their own, uh, their own unique needs, their own unique individual challenges and circumstances. And yet, Jesus, it, the text over and over again says, Jesus loves them. Now, how is it? Jesus is able to love these, this community, this, this kind of non-traditional family in such a profound way. How is it that Jesus is able to love Lazarus and love Mary and love Martha in, 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 in the ways and serve them and give himself to them? And the early church fathers who read the scriptures would have had a name for the way that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. 
In fact, they would have given it, they would have, they would have had a whole virtue associated with the way that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And the virtue that the early church, as they read these stories and they heard these stories, the virtue that would have been on the forefront of their minds was the virtue that we know as chastity. And chastity is kind of a weird word. It's kind of old, it's kind of antiquated. And most of us, if we're honest, uh, think that chastity is really about our sexuality, don't we? And yet the early church, the early Christians, as they looked at this passage, as they looked at this kind of material, they would, and they looked at the way that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and the way that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus in turn loved and responded to Jesus, they would have used the word chastity to describe it. And there's something so powerful about that that I, want, I think it, we need to relearn this virtue. Because in our culture, uh, I think we actually need to see, if we're going to avodah, we need to learn again how to practice a virtue, uh, the virtue of chastity in Christian community, and do that together. Now, most of us assume that chastity is basically an antiquated way of saying celibacy, right? That's pretty much what we think. We think chastity is how, is how our grandparents talked about, you know, not sleeping with people you weren't married to. And, um, and so, and we think that that's pretty much what it means. And so as long as we're not doing that, then we are practicing chastity. If we're not sleeping with someone we're not married to, and we're single, um, and we're, you know, we're not sexually active, ah, that must mean that we're practicing chastity. And uh, sadly, and, un and unfortunately, because we think that, often our, our as a Christian community, the single most dominant message that young people, I work with young people, so I'm passionate about young people, the single most dominant message that young people get about their sexuality and about their, uh, their, their, um, their, uh, their sexuality and their, their emotions, their romantic feelings, is don't. Like, let's just not. Don't go there. Don't do it. Don't, don't, you know, wait till you're ready to get married and then, you know, hurry up and do that. But the main message that they get is don't. Don't do it. Don't, don't mess around. Don't, don't be in places you're not supposed to be. Don't be touching people you're not supposed to touch. Just, no, just don't. And, um, and sadly, um, the virtue of chastity is so much bigger than don't. In fact, the early church would have looked at this passage, this, this incredible passage of love being given and received by, this, uh, by these two sisters and this one brother and Jesus, and they would have said, here's chastity playing out. It's not just about something that you're not doing together. It's about so much more. It's about what you are doing together. It's a positive virtue that we practice as a community. So what does chastity actually mean? Well, in some ways, we're right. Chastity does, have an, uh, does mean not to be uh, sexually active with someone you're not married to. This is actually good news for us. This is, this is good news for us because... We live in a, in a highly sexualized culture, don't we? All right, one person thought that was funny. Okay. We live in a highly sexualized culture where outside of the church, the dominant message is do whatever you want to do with whoever you want to do, just as long as you're not exploitative or forceful about it, right? Right? And so it's understandable that, that, that maybe in the church we kind of react against that and say, okay, well, the, if the message of the world is due, then our message needs to be don't. No, chastity means, chastity understands the gift of God, which is embedded in our, in our sexuality, which is embedded in us as people created to know and love and, and to know God and to love others, to be known and to be loved. And yet... What chastity says, and what the, the tradition, uh, you know, what, what chastity as a virtue says is the kind of knowledge that is, uh, that kind of knowledge of, uh, between, a, uh, you know, sexual knowledge, the union between a man and a woman is so profound, is so significant, is so unique that it takes the covenant of marriage to actually create the safety, create the contexts 
for us to be able to enter into this powerful and remarkable uh, unitive uh, relationship. And so it's right not to uh, be be practicing that outside of that covenant because if we do, we cheapen it. But yet, chastity is not just about what we don't do. It also has two other very profound definitions. Here's one. Chastity is is about uh, refraining uh, from sexual behavior with people that you're not uh, married to, but also has a profound impact for those of us. Uh, it also means to in- cultivate a purity of intention toward other people. Chastity means cultivating a purity of heart towards another person. And that's not just romantically, that is in all areas of life, Right? I was, um, this, just this morning, my, my uh, daughter was selling some um, donuts that she'd made, homemade donuts. They were really good, and they're all gone. You can't buy any more now. But uh, there was this, uh, as we, she was doing this, selling these donuts that she'd made, the joke that people were saying is, oh, she, she sold one to you for 50 cents. She sold one to me for $5, right? And, uh, and it was a joke uh, with the idea that, that uh, my daughter was, you know, exploiting the, uh, the crowd for profit. And yet, why was that joke so funny and so at the top of our minds? Isn't that precisely what we do all the time? Isn't that precisely the, the context and the culture that we live in? We are constantly uh, looking for ways, or if we're New Yorkers, trying to protect ourselves from the people that we think are trying to get one over on us, aren't we? Why do we do that? Why do we have to protect ourselves uh, and be so so, uh, guarded lest someone take advantage of our good graces? Why? Because of a lack of chastity, really. Chastity is the discipline of cultivating a purity of intention towards another person. It is a form of love because classically, uh, the definition of love is to will the good of another person. Not just a feeling, uh, having a warm, fuzzy feeling towards you, but classically speaking, in a Christian definition, love, to love is to will the good of another, to cultivate, in other words, a purity of intention towards another person that seeks that they might grow and stretch and become all that God has created them to be. We see this in the passage in Mary and Martha, don't we? We see this in the passage where Jesus, who loves Mary, Martha, and Lazarus goes to wake, uh, goes to, to raise Lazarus in the midst of their grief. We see this in the way that when, when Martha comes and she engages Jesus and she's got questions about why didn't you come and if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know God will give you whatever. And Jesus engages her in a way that wills Mary, wills Martha's good. In, uh, in other, the other Gospels, you see Jesus when Martha's working and working and working in the kitchen. You know that story? Martha's in the back, and she's, she's working and working and serving. Meanwhile, her sister Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet. The only time that it's ever t- said in the gospel that any disciple is sitting at Jesus' feet, I find that really interesting since um, that was the, the language used. It, it, Paul used the very same language about sitting at the feet of, of the rabbi Gamaliel. It was, a, it was the posture of discipleship, and Mary's taken this posture of discipleship. Meanwhile, Martha's in the kitchen. In the midst of that, she, Martha comes out and says, Master, Jesus, tell, tell my sister to come in the kitchen and help me. And Jesus responds, he wills the good of Martha by saying, Martha, Martha, Mary's chosen something good. It's not going to be taken away from her. The invitation of Jesus to Martha and the, and the, and the ability, likewise, to, to grieve with Mary, to cry with Mary, to treat Mary as a disciple in a culture where uh, women didn't get to be disciples. And yet Jesus recognizes Mary's discipleship, and he allows her to, uh, to sit at his feet in this really profound way. But here's the third, here's the third meaning of chastity. And the third meaning of chastity means to be relationally available to people um, because you're not physically available to them. 
to be relationally open, to be open to relationships with men and women, with, with p- people who are, diff- who, who, are, uh, who are different from you, people that you don't, uh, that you're not, that aren't a part of your immediate clan, your immediate family, to be relationally available because you're not romantically available to them. Here we see, in the most profound way, we see this kind of chastity being practiced, this profound loving. This is not just relational uh, availability and like, you know, being nice to people. This is like deep, profound relational availability that gets uncomfortable. Uh, We see this kind of chastity practiced in John chapter 12, where Mary breaks the perfume open and pours it on Jesus' feet. And wipes the perfume with her hair. This is so important, John actually says it twice. He says that at the beginning of 11, Mary, she's the one who put oil on Jesus' feet and wiped it with her hair. And then in 12 says, Mary, she took the bottle, she broke it, and she wiped it, it, wiped it with her hair. Women in those days didn't let down their hair in public. For, for Mary to untie her hair in a house full of people and then pour oil on Jesus' feet and use her own hair to wash Jesus' feet. This is tenderness. This is is vulnerability. This is is relational availability and, 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 and vulnerability to the point that it's really awkward for everybody in the room. And that's why Judas and the others speak up and they say, why are you letting her do this? Why, why isn't this, hasn't this been sold, the money given to the poor? What's going on here? And Jesus stands up for Mary. Really fascinatingly, Mary, Jesus has been talking since uh, John chapter 5, and probably bef- and, and really before that, but he starts talking about it explicitly in John chapter 5. He's been talking for five chapters about his upcoming death. And his disciples, the men, don't see what's happening. And somehow, what Jesus says about what Mary's doing in this moment is she is preparing me for my burial. I was studying this passage with my two girls, and I said, why is it that Mary seems to get this thing that the other disciples didn't get? Like Mary spent a lot less time with Jesus. She didn't travel with him. She did sit at his feet, but, uh, you know, but she didn't travel with him. Why is it that she seems to understand, seems to intuitively respond, seems to act out this really vulnerable, loving thing before Jesus that the other disciples don't, and, they don't, and, and that Jesus interprets as she understands she's doing this because she knows I'm about to go into a period of suffering. And my... Uh, my uh, one of my daughters said, well, it's probably because she listened to Jesus and thought through what he was saying. And I thought, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And um, here's, here's my point. This kind, of, uh, this kind of vulnerable, loving gesture of of openness and of trust where Mary could give uh, even in this potentially humiliating way, could make herself vulnerable to ridicule, could make herself vulnerable in the in the in the con in, in this particular context out of love and devotion to her friend, which could be so easily eroticized and so easily uh, easily taken uh, for to, to twisted to, to to mean something else. Jesus says this is actually a profound thing. It has nothing to do with what you're all thinking. It has to do with her understanding what's going to happen to me and and uh, becoming um, and preparing me for what God is going to do. I imagine a world. Where we, where we learn as a church community, we learn again this virtue of chastity. This virtue of what it means for us to, in the midst of a sexualized culture, say we are going to honor, as Paul says, the marriage bed. That not because we think sex is dirty or sex is bad or our bodies are bad or there's something about our desires that are bad. Uh, no, no, no. We actually, it's not that at all. It's that we have such a high view 
of the kind of vulnerability and transparency in, in this kind of union that we know that it takes, a, a, it takes a covenant before God and before a community for that to be safe and not devastating. Did you know that all around New York City, people are engaged in all kinds of behavior that, is, that they think is giving them liberation and pleasure and is sucking their soul out of them? And we want to be a community that says, uh, that puts... Uh, allows our desires to be, to be lived out in that way, and yet also want to be a community that cultivates together a purity of heart, a purity of intention, so that we can love and will the good of other people, whether, they, uh, whether they're our good friend Chris from across the cubicle or whether they're people that, that have, that, uh, with whom we disagree across the aisle. All you have to do in this day and age is look on social media and see that we are in desperate need of, of learning how to will the good of people who are different than us, aren't we? And sadly, um, we Christians have, us, uh, have some growth to do in the midst of that. And then lastly, what does it mean for us as a community in this incredible, lonely city of New York, where everyone is so time poor, and, and thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands are so desperately lonely, what would it mean for us to be a community of people, to become a community of people that were available to one another in risky relationship, because we weren't available to each other in simple, erotic pleasure? How can we do that? How can we create and relearn this pattern? I think we do it at the feet of the one who said, leave her alone. What she has done is preparing me for my hour, for my burial, for that time when I will, when the Son of Man will be lifted up and, and die and rise again and give us new life. So, to, so my invitation to us today is to, is to recover an antiquated word, <laughs> relearn a, def, a multiple definition, a nuanced definition of an old virtue, and learn to practice it 